Hey there, Goulet Pens fans. It is time for episode number 213 of Goulet Q&A. And I'm in a pretty good mood because it's, uh, as of when I'm shooting this, it's Wednesday, June 6th. D-Day, technically, for anyone who um, was a part of that or affiliated with that in any way. Um, but it was uh, also launch day for us, for our website. Completely coincidental. Um, but uh, anyway, it's gone relatively smoothly so far, knock on wood, right? It's uh, 4 19 on Wednesday is when I'm recording this. By the time you see this Friday, I'm sure we're going to have everything worked out. And it's going to be a perfect, smooth, flawless experience. I mean, we're still going to have bugs, let's be honest. Anybody who's ever gone through a website migration, particularly e-commerce, where there's a huge product catalog and customer database and order history and everything, there's a lot to it. Security stuff and all that. We've done everything uh, as well as we could have prepared, I think. And uh, we're hitting some bugs. We're finding some, some interesting things. We're working some stuff out. But by and large, it's been a really pretty successful launch so far. And I'm like cautiously optimistic that all the preparation we've done over the last nine months um, has paid off and uh, getting a good response so far. Got our newly designed site, so if you haven't been to check it out yet, head on over to gulaypens.com and check out our new site. We refreshed it a little bit. There's some different functionality. We have products rolled up under individual pens, no longer broken out by nib size anymore. There's a lot of other cool features and we have some blog posts and stuff that we wrote that break all that down. I won't do that here for you today because I have a lot of questions I'm trying to get through. Um, so uh, yeah, that's really been a huge focus for us. I did have my daughter's dance recital last weekend. It was pretty adorable. She's six, so she's a just finishing up kindergarten now and uh, she's been doing dance for a couple of years and uh, recital time is always a lot of fun for any of you dance parents out there you know what all is involved in that and it just so happened to coincide with the week that we're launching our site so it's been an eventful week for us you know but uh all things considered it's actually been pretty great i've been on my new diet so i've been adjusting to these such things trying to get more sleep, trying to eat right and all that. And that's been uh, pretty good so far. I've lost about five pounds since last week. So that's been pretty cool. Um, so if I look a little bit a little bit lighter, I don't know if you can tell the difference, but if I do, then uh, that's because I lost a couple pounds. So that's kind of cool. And uh, you know, Rachel's managed her stress pretty well with the website, all things considered. So it's been pretty good so far. Our team's been great. You know, you all been great. It's been, been a pretty interesting experience so far. So anyway. Um, some products coming out. Honestly, we've been so focused on the website. We don't have like, you know, huge stuff uh, necessarily. We do have a few things coming. Well, I said we have done a huge stuff. We definitely have a few things coming. Um, you know, Conklin uh, has had kind of a nib shortage. That's why we don't have a lot of pens uh, right now from Conklin available. Uh, but they did have some OmniFlex nibs, so we were able to arrange some. OmniFlex nibs on some of the Conklin pens, which hasn't been done before except on the Duraflex. But, uh, so we'll have some of those coming out um, next week, I think, uh, as long as uh, we're able to kind of just get everything work. We didn't want to like set any major product launches to happen right over top of our site launch because we wanted to make sure that we got everything rock solid before we send everybody flooding to the site to go check out for these hot new things. So once we feel good and stable about that, we can start to launch some new things. Um, the Stipula Passaporto, which has been, uh, you know, talked about for quite some time now, uh, is on the way to us apparently. So we should have those relatively soon. So be look on the lookout for those. And then um, there's lots of other things we're gonna be talking about. I have an entire bin, just like an 18 quart tub filled with new products for us to review and consider carrying. And um, we have some other things that are kind of in the works on the way. So be on the lookout for that. Check out the new new product section on our site for new arrivals and all that. Whatever the heck we call it now. I got to check. It's a new site, so I got to get used to the lingo now. Um, but anyway, I got uh, 12 questions for you this week. I don't know why I chose 12 questions today. I was just, I was prepping Q&A yesterday and it just felt right. So we're going to rock and roll today. I got some really good questions I wanted to answer and I just felt like trying to cram them all in. So uh, in the effort of uh, trying to maximize your value here, I'm going to get right to it. First pen and writing question from CR4, CK the sky, crack, crack for the sky on Twitter. How can you get a full fill on a Visconti Homo sapiens with a two milliliter ink sample? And I've gotten this question a little bit before, not just with the Homo sapiens, but with other pens that are of larger size. 
the Homo sapiens, though, is a particularly interesting pen because um, the pen itself is not necessarily too big. You know, it's got a long nib and stuff like that, and that's always a bit of a challenge to try and fill from a sample. You know, we came up with a two mil sample years ago, like eight years ago. Um, and uh, we did that very kind of systematically based on math, really, of how much ink we could offer, the labor that's involved, all this kind of stuff, um, based off of what we thought could get a really good writing sample and what could, um, you know, be economical as well. Um, there's others that, there's other retailers that do more that started uh, doing samples after us and they've chosen to do more. For us to change that process now is very, very cumbersome because we have 600 some inks with a whole stock supply of two mil samples. <coughs> and then some of the pens in order to do it, we'd have to raise price and all this kind of stuff. So we are just, we're sticking with what we got for right now. Uh, but anyway, it does create a problem for something like the Homo sapiens. Particularly if you go to fill with this pen, um, <laughs> the little uh, center band here uh, around the grip, it doesn't allow you to get the pen all the way down into the vial. I mean, there's a little bit of room down here, but like the nib is basically right here. So I can't quite get as down as far enough as I need to, which creates an interesting challenge because um, though you're writing from the pen, the ink flows out of the tip while you're writing with it, it actually fills from right here. It fills from the base of the feed. So you have the whole length of the nib that needs to be submersed in the ink to be able to fill properly. And you're just not able to get down there with the Homo sapiens. Now, I have a couple of hacks, uh, neither of which is for the faint of heart. First I'll say is, you know, it's probably just not the ideal pen to use for sampling, but I understand if you're like, no, the Homo sapiens is the pen I use. I want to sample it, etc. Okay, I'm gonna show you how to do that but just be aware you're taking your pen into your own hands when you do it. Okay, so the first one is when you go to fill it in, fill it in here, you notice it's got this nice round kind of center band that um, blocks it. So uh, the first one I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna, gonna shove it in there just a little bit, not a ton, but just really kind of press it up against it and I gotta hold it in place. And I'm actually gonna tilt the vial like 90 degrees so that the whole thing is submersed. Now, if I let it go, or if I do something crazy, it's gonna dump ink all over the place. So I don't want to do that, um, but it is a power filler, which is technically a vacuum fill. And uh, I'm using this London Fog because it's somewhat clear and can demonstrate what it is I'm trying to do. So I've got it in place here. I'm gonna try not to, it's hard to do this and show you. It's easier to do it if I'm not trying to actually show, but I'll try and do it like that. Can you see somewhat what's going on here? Ah, of course, doesn't want to focus on the pen, but go figure. There it goes. Um, so I'm going to press it down. You can see the bubbles starting to come out of the front of the pen, and voila, I get a little fill. And then I can do that a couple times, and it's going to get a little more. I can even kind of tilt it beyond 90 if I'm feeling brave, and it's going to get in there. And it's you know it's not going to fill the pen all the way, but it's going to fill it a respectable amount. And you can just do little pumps like that if you want to. And, uh, you know, by the end of the thing, I got about a mil and a half in here, which is actually a pretty respectable amount of ink inside that pen. Boom. Okay. So that's method number one. Now, if you're doing that, it's very easy to get ink in places that you don't really want it to be. So you got to be intentional about how you do that. Okay. If that's not quite for you, then I have another hack, which is also not for the faint of heart. And uh, this one involves removing the nib. Okay. So now this, this pen has a nib, a replacement nib is not inexpensive. Uh, replacement nib for Visconti, it runs somewhere around $350. So you do not want to screw this thing up. But technically, this again, this is at your own risk. Um, you can actually remove the nib unit. And I've done it before. They have a nib removal tool that they don't sell to the public. So I won't even demonstrate with that because um, you don't have it. So um, if, you know, if I really wanted to do it, I would, I would, uh, I would do it that way. But you can remove it on your own with your life in your own hands. Um, grab it at the base of the nib and the feed, you know, supporting both, wrapping your fingers around. Some people do it this way where they hold the, th the nib with their thumb and the feed with their, their forefinger. That's fine. I do it kind of both ways. I actually usually do it the other way. It's really up to you. Um, and just support it well and just give it a little twist. Now there's an O-ring on the back of this nib housing and I've removed this nib a bunch of times. Usually the first time you remove it is the hardest. So it's like not, again, that's why it's not for the faint of heart, but you can theoretically do it. I wouldn't recommend doing this as a regular practice. This would be like in an emergency ink sampling situation, whatever that is. <laughs> But anyway, I'm trying to like lace this with disclaimers here so that Visconti doesn't be like, 
Brian, what the heck did you tell people to do? I'm just empowering you with inf information and entertainment so that you know what is possible. Okay, so I removed that. It has a little bit of an O-ring, uh, which my O-ring is actually chilling out down in the bottom of my pen here. Uh, and then I can remove that. And then it's relatively easy. I can use an ink syringe and I can just syringe up everything that is in my sample vial, like so. You can tell I've done this a couple times. And then you gotta open the back a little bit because you're gonna have to get your syringe past the seal. Um, otherwise, you're just gonna fill the whole grip with pen or with ink. And uh, I gotta get it in here so that it kind of falls down in. It's a little bit harder if you don't have the demonstrator version because you can't really see what's going on. Um, but more or less, you can just kind of work this piston to get the ink down in there. Voila, it fills, there we go. And voila, I've got the entire thing filled. And then you just put your nib back in place, support it carefully. Screw it back in place and voila. I now have a completely inked pen. So a couple of hacks for you. The bottom line is it's not the most ideal pen for these sample vials. Of all the pens we carry, this is like one of the three maybe that has trouble filling out of a sample vial, but it is technically possible and now you know how to do it. All right, pens to paper plans on Instagram. How do you maintain your ink syringes and bulb syringes? I had trouble drying out my bulb syringe and had to throw it out because it grew mold. I'm worried about using a bulb syringe on my pens now. Um, you know, honestly, I have never had much of an issue with mold in my bulb syringes, though I can certainly understand how that would be possible depending on what your local water supply is like. A lot of water supply, you know, tap water and stuff will have chlorine and stuff like that to help fight those things, but it's certainly possible because it's in a dark, wet place. Um, what I do um, for both of these, I'll start with the ink syringe because uh, basically I do nothing. I do nothing to maintain my own. I've never had a problem with anything, not to say you couldn't, um, but um, I don't do anything there. My bulb syringes, I do a little more maintenance on these, but it's really not much. Um, so it's interesting. I actually drew upon my power washing experience because I was a home power washer with my father and his business. My dad still does that as his business. Uh, I was doing that after I graduated college, before I started to get pens, actually when I started making pens, I was washing houses with my dad. So um, spraying down and killing mold on houses was my entire job. So um, the thing that kills mold is chlorine, right? Chlorine bleach. So um, the way to get rid of mold in here is uh, chlorine bleach. Uh, you don't need to do it straight. You can dilute it a little bit. Basically you just mix household bleach you can do a little dish soap in there too, like a little Dawn dish detergent or something like that. Uh, it doesn't have to be brand specific, um, but you just mix that in there, just a surfactant to help uh, give the chlorine something to kind of grab onto. And uh, you soak it up with your bulb syringe. You can flush it a few times, suck it up in there, swish it around, and then leave it sit maybe overnight. If you do that, then certainly anything that's in there would be dead um, because chlorine kills mold in a relatively quick fashion. But even if you have like tons of it growing in here or something like that. You leave it sitting in there, it's gonna do it. And then when you flush it out, if you see like black flaky stuff coming out of there, well, that's that's mold. Um, not great for your pens, true. Uh, but if you flush it out with chlorine, it's gonna be squeaky clean and basically brand new. So you can rest assured that that will uh, pretty much take care of it. And then once you've got the chlorine and all that kind of stuff clean out of there, then you just flush it with clear water and you're good to go. So that's really all the maintenance you need to worry about as far as I'm concerned. But of course, if you're like hyper sensitive, hyper aware, that kind of thing, you can always replace the bulb syringe uh, every periodically if you, if you want. But if you just, um, you know, get on a regular chlorinating regimen with your uh, bulb syringes, you should be uh, in pretty darn good shape. All right, from Umer on Instagram, does oblique medium of the Lamy 2000 get any stub-like very line variation. What would be the point of oblique if there was absolutely none? Because if the tip is round with zero variation, it doesn't matter whether the pen, pen is held like this or like this, which is what the obliques allow, right? <clears throat> okay. So it's interesting that you asked this and timely uh, because we just got in the uh, Lamy 2000 oblique broad and oblique double broad. I don't believe we got any oblique mediums. Um, we kind of placed like a special order into Lamy and got a few of them. It's not anything that I think we're gonna have as a regular supply, but we have a couple. And uh, being the pen nerd that I am, as soon as they came in, I was like, give me, give me, give me, give me. And uh, so I kept an oblique, 
I already had an oblique medium, technically actually, uh, that I acquired years ago. I got an oblique broad and an oblique double broad. And I've done some nib grinding training with various folks, and, and so I very much understand how to make obliques. Um, and so it's interesting to see uh, for me like how Lamy does obliques, because even when I went and toured Lamy in December, I didn't see the specific nib grinds that they do. Um, I only got to see uh, other aspects of their manufacturing. So it was kind of interesting for me to see. So I did writing samples uh, for all three of them that I'm going to share with you here today. So the oblique medium, I mean, it's the basic principle of it is uh, it's kind of like a stub that is ground at an angle. Um, and I've done nib sizes and grinds in a fountain pen 101, and I won't go into deep detail about uh, obliques necessarily, um, but I will cover a little bit. So these are writing samples of all three. And I show these to, to show you basically the finer the oblique is, the less variation you're actually going to see. I mean, you can see there's a little bit there, especially when you get over to the X's. And if you're writing in block print, it actually shows up a little bit more than just with traditional cursive. So it's really gonna depend on your handwriting style. Um, but the broader you go, the more variation you see, especially when you get to that double broad, the X's gets a little more pronounced, I guess, right? But even when you're writing in the, the cursive script, it's not very dramatic. Um, oblique nibs, basically what an oblique is, I'll try and write out a, I'll try and real, real time draw out an example of an oblique with an oblique, meta oblique. So uh, let me tear up a fresh sheet here for you. So when you have an oblique, typically your nib is going to be, uh, I'll do a, a drawing like this. You got the nib, there's your slit, and then you're going to have, um, you know, kind of a round ball. This is a terrible drawing. But there is your typical nib, right? So if you're looking at the face of the nib, just like I'm holding the pen like this, this is what you're going to see, you know, nice and rounded. Uh, with an oblique, you can do it tilted one way or the other, but I'm gonna do what is typical and what the Lamy ones are, which is called a left foot oblique. That is where basically the nib is ground such that you don't see uh, this part. So it's ground a little bit of a slant. Uh, and what does that actually buy you? It allows you to basically rotate the pen in your hand to the left, a left foot oblique, um, so that if you rotate the pen in your hand or you twist your hand a little bit, it allows you to write uh, like that fashion. So it's, it's subtle. It's not as drastic as a stub. It's not as drastic as an architect, but it's going to be somewhat drastic if you hold it at, not drastic. It's going to be subtle line variation if you hold it at a very, very, very specific angle, depending on your writing style. So. It's the kind of thing that like obliques have become somewhat obscure recently. Uh, basically, no one offers them stock. Uh, Pelican offered some, but even they're scaling them back. Lamy, this is the first I've used their broader obliques because they don't offer them regularly. Um, and uh, I don't know anyone else that really does offer them regularly. It's something that usually you see kind of custom ground from Dinbeisters or you see them with vintage pens. Um, but uh, there are people out there who obliques is like, oh, hallelujah, you know, and it's like the answer to all of their pen troubles and it's just the way that they love to write and then they usually find a custom Nibmeister and get everything ground to that liking. You know, it's for me, it, it adds a little bit of a little bit of flair, maybe. Um, but it, it's also for me, it's such an adaptive way to write that I'm like, OK, I can I can do it, but it's just not for me. And like I've passed my obliques because we had, you know, this Lamy 2000 and we had the other Lamy, the steel nib obliques um, a little while ago. And uh, I passed those around to my team and all but like one or two people hated them on the team. Like they were just couldn't get them to write right or they wrote with them, but they're like, this is just frustrating because you have to hold it at a specific angle and it's not as forgiving as regular nib. But there were like one, especially like Kelsey on our team, I remember she used it and picked it up and it was like, oh, this is the best pen I've ever written with. And it was like, who knew? So it's, it's in a just weird place right now with obliques because there's not a lot of them like super affordable where a bunch of people can just like try them and see if they like them. Even with the Lamy 2000, like it's not a cheap pen. So even if you were to like look at our site and be like, oh, should I get an oblique double broad? I don't know. It's $167. It's not the cheapest thing to just experiment with. But for a very select few people, it's gonna be like the best pen you've ever written with. For most everybody else, it's gonna be like meh. You know, it's going to be interesting, maybe, but it's not going to be like your favorite nib. So it just kind of gets into this weird place where it's hard to know until you try it, but then it's hard to try it because you can't get it. So hopefully this helps for you at all. 
Um, but the bottom line is, if you're going for line variation, go with a stub. Uh, don't go with an oblique. Uh, the oblique, especially in a medium, it's going to be so specific and so um, difficult to tell the line variation that basically you just need to consult a nibmeister and, and see what it is that you're going for and they can just cater something specific to your needs. There's nothing widely available that's going to be an oblique medium that I can name for you um, that I think is worth you just kind of winging it and trying out. Cool. All right. Next question is from Barbara G on Facebook. Are flex nibs and soft nibs the same thing? If not, what's the difference? Uh, well, the truth is they can be or not. <laughs> it really depends on the manufacturer, what they call it, what's the reality. Um, there's no definitive point when something goes from being soft to being flexible. Um, and it's entirely subjective. Um, you know, there's manufacturers that I've seen in the past that call something semi-flex or even flex, and I'm like, this thing is stiff as a nail. Why would they call this that? Uh, it just really depends. There's no flex police or anything like that. Uh, part of the reason I took this question is because Drew and I are actually going to be coming out with a video um, specifically on flex and soft versus flex is something we specifically cover in the video. So hopefully that helps. So usually the term soft uh, means springy. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting line variation, but it means the nib has some bounce to it. The nib will have some give and it will... Um, uh, give you a smoother, kind of softer writing experience. You might get a little line variation, especially because as the nib is kind of bending a little bit, uh, you might get increased ink flow, uh, which doesn't necessarily widen the tines, but it might widen the gap between the feed and the nib, which could increase some of the ink flow. Um, is it gonna be enough to give you like what you s would think of with a typical like copper plate or Spencerian calligraphy? No, not by any means. Um, so that's why soft is definitely like the safer term to use unless you're specifically going for dramatic line variation. Some manufacturers get this, other ones, especially, you know, the term soft and flex and all this kind of stuff, um, it, it can mean different things even in different countries. So manufacturers from different countries, as I'm trying to you know, understand more about how manufacturing works and different, you know, marketing terms and manufacturing terms work for different countries. Um, I'm finding it interesting having language conversation uh, with people who uh, English is not their first language because they tend to use the word flex very freely uh, as kind of soft, but here in like the English speaking languages in the English speaking pen community, flex pretty much means like glorious widely opening uh, tines and that's not necessarily what I think most manufacturers are intending but that is what I think the community has come to understand it to be and maybe I'm perpetuating that by even saying that but that's what I have observed by being a member of the community. So um, I like to use the word soft that's kind of the safe word in the flex world um, but uh, flex is something that Usually line variation is your goal. It's not necessarily as much about how springy it feels or how smooth it is, but you're going for that visual difference in the writing width. Um, that's where flex really comes in. So we're gonna cover that in more detail, maybe with some visuals and stuff like that uh, in the other video that's coming out. But that is really uh, the difference. It's feel for softness versus true line variation. Now, of course, Pilot Falcon tends to kind of break all that apart because they call it soft, but you can actually get decent line variation on it, but they don't tout it as being flexible. They say it's just for the springiness, but you know, go figure. There has to be one, uh, what is it? Uh, one exception that proves the rule, I guess. Anyway, uh, next question is from Melissa H on Facebook. My Pneider La Grande Bellezza in Extra Fine has a sweet spot. If I'm writing and the nib turns even the slightest bit, no ink. Is there a way to fix this or do I live with it? I'm thinking it's because of the flex in the nib. I have see even the flex in the nib. There you go. It's not a flexible nib here, Melissa. So the term is just, you know, ever present. Um, I have one other gold nib and extra fine, but it's a vanishing point, which is like impossible to turn in my hand while I'm writing. Okay, so I have a Pneider La Grande Bellezza myself. I went for the broad though, so I'm not gonna be able to be super specific in the demonstration of this video because the broad is very different from the extra fine. The broad is very forgiving. It's almost kind of stubby a little bit. Um, but the extra fine, it tends to be a little on the fine side. And uh, so the nib is a softer nib. They call it the quill nib um, because it kind of like is 
feels light and feathery, I guess. Um, but it's got a little spring to it. It's not what I would call a flex nib. It does not have this big open line variation due to the tines just coming way apart. Uh, but uh, that's just me talking here. Um, so the extra fine, you know, I, so I did a writing sample with all the nibs uh, when we got the pens in. And uh, I did that and put it in the nib nook and did writing samples. I didn't find the nib to be as terrible of a sweet spot as maybe other pens. You know, one pen that's notorious for having a fine sweet spot is actually the Lamy 2000. Uh, and the Lamy 2000 Extra Fine, I feel like, does have a pretty fine sweet spot. I didn't feel like at least the at least the one Penider Extra Fine that I actually inked up and wrote with um, did not feel that way to me. That doesn't mean that yours isn't like that. Um, and to that effect, I would say there's a couple of options here. One is I would look at, you know, maybe you, as you say you, as you're rotating it, look at closely. Is it both directions that you're rotating or is it like just the way that you happen to hold it in your hand, the way that you're writing with it, you're just like a little bit on the cusp of one side of kind of that sweet spot. And then when you happen to get to the end of a line or something like that, you're rotating it just a little bit. That happens sometimes, like if you plant your hand while you're writing and you get to the end of a page, you could actually end up rotating the pen in your hand as you're moving across the page. So maybe just observe your own writing behavior. See if there's any pattern to where it is on the page or you know how you're holding it or something like that. Certain letters, certain words, whatever, that you tend to lose it. Try and observe your own behavior and see if there's anything maybe that you're doing as you're writing that could be doing that. Uh, or maybe you're like, well, if I have to change my writing habits, then this isn't the right pen for me. That could be totally legit too. So first thing I would say is observe your habits. Sometimes if you actually just turn the pen a little bit in your hand, like if you find that when you're you're turning it to the left, you're like it's you're rotating it naturally rotating in your hand to the left, maybe try taking the pen and actually moving it to the right a little bit. It might feel a little weird at first because it's just not your natural inclination to hold it there, but see if that does it. I've literally sometimes, even with members of my own team, seeing them writing and they're like, this pen is skippy or drawing or whatever. And I'm watching them write and then I just take the pen and I mm, just turn it a little bit and then it writes perfectly. And I'm like, there you go. So try that just because that's the easiest, frankly, to do because you can just do it yourself and you don't have to deal with shipping pens back and forth and all this. So try that first. And if you're like, nope, it's just the sweet spot. I know that for a fact. Then I would say, you know, one, it could be maybe the ink. Maybe the ink you're using is dry. Look at that. That could be a factor maybe. Um, otherwise, paper, you know, paper. Maybe you don't want to change your paper. I don't know. But the slicker the paper you go on, usually the less forgiving it is in terms of a sweet spot because the, the less absorbent paper is not, it's not sucking the ink out. It's not trying to draw it out like a more absorbent paper might. So it's going to be a little less forgiving for that kind of stuff. Um, if you're like, nope, I want to use this ink, this paper, this pen has to fit everything else in my writing lifestyle. I totally get that. That's when I would ask you to reach out to our team. Um, we have some video features. We have some other things that we can work with you, maybe on that, or you're like, this is not going to work. You can actually send it back to my team, especially with something like Penider. It's a newer brand, newer nib design in general. It's brand new, so we're trying to understand it more. We've played with it a bunch and talked about it as a team, but once it gets out there kind of in the wild, it's good for us to know how you're experiencing it. So we love getting feedback. I say this because my, my team has to field most of the feedback, but no, no, that's why they're here. They really, we love getting the feedback because it helps us to learn and be better. And then we can either pass that feedback up to the manufacturer, or we can see if maybe you did get a pen that just was ground in such a way that it specifically has a sweet spot. And then we can help you with that. And we might be able to get you one or fix that one or do some adjustment that would get you a better writing pen. So. Um, try those things yourself and then reach out to my team and see if uh, that helps. But, uh, you know, a $400 pen like this, it would be really nice if you uh, could get a pen that you're 100% happy with. That would be our goal and that's something that would make my team really happy as well. So, uh, you got a little homework there, but uh, either way we want you to be happy in the end. All right, Jonathan Hansen 89 on Instagram. Is there any way to do tying alignment without a loop? Okay, so this is a loop, it's a little magnifying glass, you know, you can see, woo. Um, but, uh, you know, a loop is something that we sell and you can buy it or not, you know. Um, you might have it yourself and you just use it to, you hold it up to your, your eye like this and you use it to inspect your nib, especially to see if your tines, especially to see if your tines are aligned uh, for just these such things. Um, especially if it's feeling scratchy or something like that. <clears throat> but, um, 
you know, it's a 10x magnification on the particular one that we carry. There's other ones that you can get that are higher power, lower power, whatever. But um, ultimately, really what you need is just some kind of magnification because you're trying to look at something that is perhaps less than a millimeter in width. It's just hard to see, even for young eyes, it's hard to see what the heck is going on there. And if you think about like, okay, an extra fine nib might be 0.4 millimeters in width, and then you divide that by two because there's two tines, you're trying to look at something that's a fifth of a millimeter wide and see if there's any, you know, a misalignment or anything. It's just, it's really hard to tell without a loop. So a loop helps tremendously. Um, not that if you don't have a loop, you can't have an enjoyable writing experience, but if you are ever attempting to adjust your own nibs, a loop is like the most basic thing that you could possibly need. Like you can skip, you know, a lot of the other tools if you really are just trying to like, no, I'm not trying to regrind, I'm not trying to do anything fancy. I just want to be able to inspect my pen so I understand what's going on. You know, if I want, if I think, if I'm having flow issues and want to see if there's junk in the feed or junk in the slit of the nib, you get a loop, you look in there and you're like, yep, sure enough, there's a bunch of junk in there. Now I know, I need to clean my pen. You know, whatever, you can do that a whole lot easier with a loop. So I would say loop is like square one. Uh, but if you don't have it, it's not that you can't do any of that other assessment. It's just a lot harder because you're more or less flying blind or you're just guessing because you can't see all the details. Um, you can tell a little bit by how it's writing if things are misaligned. And you may be able to do some adjustments. Um, but what you can't tell is uh, you can tell if there's like major misalignment going on, but what you can't really tell is if it is properly aligned, it's still writing scratchy. Is there a little bit of a burr? Is there a little bit of something else going on there? Some of that stuff is like, uh, would you even know what you're looking at if you saw it? And if you hadn't kind of been had a little bit of, you know, understanding or training or, or experience with pens, mm, now we're getting into like, okay, this is like nib, nib work uh, that we're getting into. Is that realistic? I don't know. So when you get into the loop, that's when it can get dicey in terms of, do you know what you're looking at? Do you know what you're trying to find? I don't know. I think it's interesting personally just to grab a loop and start looking around because how the heck else are you going to learn? Um, most of the people that are doing nib work are self-taught anyway. So um, I think it's interesting just to start experimenting, but it might not be for everybody. So do you have to have it? No, but it sure as heck helps. All right. Next question. This one is about ink. Not a real doctor on Twitter. <laughs> the range of fountain pen inks is vast. So how about a tool that suggests the closest color match to a set of RGB values? Would love to be able to write in a color that's as close as possible to that of my university or Brian's shirt for that matter. This is a pretty cool shirt, I gotta say. Um, <laughs> um, I think that'd be cool. You know, we um, with the launch of our new site, um, we had to kind of take one step backward before we could take two steps forward. Um, specifically with our comparison tools like the Swab Shop, Nibnook, and Pen Plaza. Um, yes, so that would be really cool. We've thought about doing an RGB code or a hex code or something like that uh, feature for our Swab Shop so that if you, you know, had a paint color and you knew you had, um, you know, the, the hex code or something for it, or if you're going digitally online and you, you know, you have the specific codes, could you get an ink color to match? It gets a little bit challenging just because like, I mean, there's there's color features, there's like hex code color pickers in Photoshop that we could use to assess that. Um, but the difficult part is there's some inks that have some pretty decent shading. There's some that look very different <laughs> in different pens. So it's like, how do we actually assign the actual hex code? So there's a lot of kind of subjectivity and decision making that needs to happen in order to do that. And that's just a project that we haven't quite taken on yet. But I will say, with that, that we are looking at our comparison tools as a summer project. We had to, again, because of some of the things that um, are, are different now on our website versus the old one that we had, we had a lot of custom code on our old site. And unfortunately, it's very much sucks for us, um, but all of the custom development we've done for those comparison tools, the code is useless now on our new site and we have to throw it out and redo it all over again. And we just didn't have the time or the resources to do that prior to launch. So it's a project that we're looking to take on. We've actually got development hours already staffed for the summer for these tools. Um, but uh, you know, we're all ears for ideas like this and this will definitely be in conversation of having some kind of uh, picker, picker type tool thing. So I appreciate the suggestion and always open to these types of ideas. 
Henry Stein 81 on Twitter asks, is there any way you can tell if a specific ink will work with your fountain pen? I know inks will vary in dryness or wetness, but how can I tell which type my nib or pen will handle best without having to try hundreds of inks? Thanks and keep up the great work. Um, specific ink will work in your pen. Uh, you basically, you can't. It's hard. I mean, it's just really hard. It's kind of like, um, you know, you can, you can go down some roads, like you can say, okay, I, I know I like blue, therefore I'll probably like this blue in my ink, um, but there's not a lot of like scientific, repeatable kind of technical specs on these inks that you can use to assess exactly how it's going to work in any pen, especially because there's human elements to writing. So my wife and I, she writes with four finger grip and holds her pen at a much steeper angle than I do. I hold mine in a three fingered lower grip. She gets a different writing experience than I do. Same pen, same nib, same ink, paper, everything. She gets a different writing experience. So she has different preferences than I do. And the ink looks different on paper. With mine, my, my lines are usually a little thicker and a little darker than hers. So she tends to use broader nibs, very saturated in color. I like inks. I like saturated inks too, but I usually do stuff with higher shading. Um, and, uh, and you know, I still like broad nibs too, but I might go with finer nibs than her in the, for the most part. So it really depends on your individual style. So it's just, it's hard because there's just nothing that I could put on the website and say, I could give you a hundred different technical specs and then you could go to use it and be like, bah, these lie, you know, because there's too much variable. There's basically, basically just too many factors. Um, you know, there's ink reviews that can help. Going off others' experiences can help. I can talk about it. Other reviewers and stuff can talk about it. But um, if it's a specific property that you're looking for, you're gonna have to search intently for that property. Like, you know, like for ink example, waterproofness. Okay, that's that's something you can kind of look for, but um, it's gonna there's gonna be so many other variables um, that are gonna make a difference. Uh, my team's here to help. We have email, live chat. Uh, phone calls, social media, all that stuff, where we can help you to kind of narrow some of these things down. Um, but basically, it's just hard to know until you experience it. I, it's kind of like trying on clothes or like painting a room in your house, maybe tasting food or wine. You can listen to other people talk about it. You can read about it. You can read all the caloric content and ingredients and nutritional facts about food or whatever it is. You can read all the things about clothes and the cut and all that kind of stuff. But until you try it on, you feel how it fits on your own weird body, it's just, it's gonna be guessing at best. And it's kind of the same things with ink. So that's why we do samples because it's a minimal investment. It's a little bit of hassle if you're looking for something uber specific, you gotta go through a bunch of inks. Not hundreds, but you gotta go through a few. But you know, the journey is the reward and part of the experience is getting to learn and understand and experience different types of ink. And that can be part of the journey. If you're like, no, I want one ink to use the rest of my life and I wanna get it right on the first try, that's gonna be a little bit tough. And I'm just gonna set that expectation for you. You're gonna be disappointed if that's the expectation. Maybe say, I wanna try 10 and the best of those 10 is gonna be the one that I'm gonna stick with and use the rest of my life. Okay, I feel pretty good about you being able to pick one out of 10 with a little bit of research and then being able to kind of move forward with that. But that's pretty much what you're gonna expect in the fountain pen world, my friend. All right, troubleshooting question. This is from Eugenia M on Facebook. I like to change ink often. Is it okay to fill the pen only halfway or should you fill it all the way up and just release what you don't want when it's time to change inks? Uh, Eugenia, you do whatever you want to do. It's totally up to you. You do not have to fill the pen all the way not by any means. It's not the kind of thing where it's like, you know, it's kind of like filling your car with gas. Uh, if you fill your car halfway with gas, you'll go half as far, but the car is gonna perform exactly the same. Whether it's got, okay, maybe very slightly different because of weight variance or something like that, but really you're not gonna notice any difference in performance of your car with a half full tank of gas versus a full tank of gas. You'll just go further. Same thing with a, a fountain pen. You know, you fill it halfway, it'll write half as much as if it was full, but you really can do whatever the heck you want. Uh, in terms of how much you fill it. In fact, when I'm writing with pens and I'm and I'm really just trying to get a sense of the ink, half the time I don't even fill it enough to like get into the converter. You know, if I'm using a cartridge converter pen, I'll use the converter and I'll just get enough to kind of saturate the feed of the pen and I'll write so I can get half a page out and then I'm like, okay, I have a pretty good sense of this ink. And then I don't have to clean out my converter half the time. And it's just like, great, okay, I just grab a bulb syringe, flush out the back of that bad boy, and then uh, I don't have to clean the converter and it saves me a few minutes. So um, it's totally up to you. You can do whatever you want, but it's not gonna affect anything too badly. Cool? 
All right, I got a couple of business questions to close it out for this week. First one is Connect K on Facebook. I suppose this would be a huge undertaking in all areas of your business, but would you consider taking pre-orders? I live in such a time zone that when you release new pens, I'm fast asleep, only to wake and receive the email notification, but the pen or ink has already sold out. That sucks, Knack, and I'm so sorry. I know that this is one thing that happens, especially to our overseas folks in Asia, Australia, um, you know, other parts of Europe maybe, it depends on how late we release things. Um, we have gone away from releasing uh, especially hot items in the morning because then even on the West Coast in the US, they're kind of getting the shaft a little bit. So um, we tend to try to launch things in like the early afternoon because then most people in Europe can get it kind of late at night. Most people in the US are already up and awake, but still we can't really do much about Asia and, and Australia because it's the complete like opposite side of the earth from us. And uh, you know, my team is only staffed during certain hours. We can't launch things at three o'clock in the morning here. It just kind of stinks, you know, and I totally get that. Um, so it would seem at first glance, like a pre-order situation might help with that. The challenge is when we're out of something that sells within a couple of hours, like when we launch it in the middle of the night, you wake up and it's already sold. Uh, that means there's such hot demand that we would sell out of pre-orders. So even if we allowed pre-orders on things, it would still sell out, except most people, it would sell out before they even kind of heard about it or would even have the opportunity to buy it. We had that, we did one pre-order. We did one pre-order once. This was for the original Jair Bomb, sorry, the second ever Jair Bomb Rouge Hematite, the 1670 ink, the original red one. We got like 10 bottles or something in the first shipment we ever got. Second shipment we ever got, I think was, I think we like finagled our way to get 20 bottles. Like think about that, 20 bottles of ink for our entire world audience. And granted our world audience was not that much to speak of back in uh, 2010, but that's all we had was 20 bottles. So after the first shipment, it sold out immediately and nobody knew who we were and we were nobody. So it sold out, but still it was hot. People were looking around for it. So we took pre-orders for the very second order. This was like our first few months in business. Um, what happened is we actually oversold on pre-orders because we didn't know exactly how many bottles we were going to get. We just said, okay, we're going to have a running list and we're going to go down the list. Technically, we didn't even take everybody's money, but we just said we have a running list and we're going to guarantee you stock as long as we get what we get. So we got it and I think we had a list of like 26 people or 27 people somewhere along those lines. And then they told us, yep, you're getting 20 bottles. And so we had to go back to those six or seven people and say, sorry, we know we told you that you were gonna get it, but you weren't first in line actually, so you're not gonna get it. And then what happened is so like the first or third person that we did, we when it came time to pony up, they were waffling and they didn't pay right away. And, you know, and so it was just like, we had to chase them down and it was just like, come on, really? So people ended up being disappointed, all this kind of stuff, and then, we never even listed it on our website. It all sold through email or whatever means that somebody had contacted us. And I was like, this is just a terrible way to do things because we're making everybody unhappy except for those few people that just happen to email us and just get lucky. I was like, this is really frustrating, an entirely manual process. We just can't function this way as we grow. So that was, that was the first and last time that we ever did that. And uh, I'm glad it's that way frankly, even though it totally stinks for people in your situation, and I recognize that, for us to do it any other way at this point with such unreliable stock, there's just no way that we could manage it well. Now, there could be an opportunity for something like, uh, um, you know, a VIPs club or uh, uh, some sort of, you know, a loyalty program or we could charge a premium to do that. I don't know, that's not gonna sit well for most people, but we could theoretically charge a premium to curb demand to be able to do a pre-order situation. I don't know, there's a lot of different ways it could possibly be done, or it could be a lottery type situation. I know I've seen that with like hot shoes when they're selling, like, uh, um, you know, if there's a local store and they're getting 100 pairs of shoes, you know, you know they're gonna sell for like $1,000 afterward, but they have to sell it at $150 or whatever the case may be. Um, so they do a lottery to keep the drama down so it's like you show up within a certain window, you put in your ticket or whatever, and then a lottery is given out and those 100 people or whatever uh, get the chance to buy the shoes first. So that could be another opportunity. 
But that's tough. That's really tough. So it's something that we're thinking and we talk about a lot here. But in the meantime, the fairest way that we know to do it um, is to be first come, first serve. Everybody gets an email notification. It goes out at the same time. I know not everybody's on the same schedule, but at least then the notification goes out at the same time and it's just kind of whoever shows up first and, and buys it, that's the thing. So, um, you know, I'm really curious to kind of piggyback that, not my question of the week, but question of this, my question of the question <laughs> is, uh, what have you guys ever seen, uh, not even pen companies necessarily, but just what have you seen other you know, companies that have hot stock uh, do uh, to curb high demand or to manage high demand during product launches, whether it's like shoes or fashion, electronics, whatever. Um, specifically, if it's like an online scenario, I would love to hear what your experiences, your positive experiences have been in that way that you feel is fair. And that's something um, that we could maybe consider. Part of the reason we moved our website is because there are a lot more opportunities for us to plug in apps and, you know, things like that. Our old site was very limited and it was just like, we can only do this. But we may have some opportunities to get creative and do some custom development that, that could be interesting. So I'm curious about that. All right, uh, next question here is from JustPat111 on Twitter. <clears throat> Hello, Brian, leaders are readers. In addition to pens and the business questions, I would appreciate to get some suggestions or references in business books too, as it seems you also read a lot. Greetings from Germany. You are great at GPC, thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Pat. Appreciate that very much. Um, I have read a bunch, and I've talked about some of my classics before in Q&A, um, specifically Q&A 98 and Q&A 113, which I've linked uh, in the blog at least. Um, and then uh, I had one, I feel like I swear I've answered before, like what are my top five business books in Q&A, and I couldn't even find it. And I was like, well, if I'm looking for like 20 minutes and I can't even find it, who the heck else is gonna find it? So if you find it, post in the comments because I would love to know. Because uh, I can't even find my own stuff. I've answered so many questions at this point. But I thought, even still, hey, I'll put a stake in the ground and, and do it. But, um, you know, I have some classics that have kind of stood the test of time. So I'll kind of give my list there. And I was originally going to be like, here's my top five. And it ended up being like 11 or something like that because I just kept thinking as I was going through, because I keep a, a list of all the books that I have read. Uh, and as I was going through, I was like, oh, dang, yeah, that one has been really good. Oh, that one too. So I got a list of like 11. And then I um, have newer ones that I've been reading in 2018 that I thought were notable. So you could get kind of like, what are my classics? And then what are my current ones that I think are, are compelling? Um, so I'll just, I'm basically just gonna go down the list. I'm not gonna elaborate a lot for the sake of time, but I will go through my list in no particular order necessarily. Um, kind of my first like five or six are some of the, some of the ones that have been most impactful and then they kind of fall off from there. Um, and then the ones from 2018 are in no particular order whatsoever. Okay, so here is my list. Um, so go ahead and grab your pen if you want to write these down. I'm going to give you the name of the book and the author as well. So first one is Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey. Then I have Crush It by Gary Vaynerchuk. Now he did a newer one this year, Crushing It, uh, that was kind of a revamp, but the original Crush It from by Gary Vaynerchuk. Start With Why by Simon Sinek. The Advantage by Pat Lincioni. Good to Great by Jim Collins. Getting Things Done by David Allen. Financial Peace by Dave Ramsey. The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas J. Stanley. Now, Financial Peace and The Millionaire Next Door are not necessarily business books. But they are more like financial books and basically like, oh, don't go crazy in debt and just be, you know, sensible. If I had to sum those books up. <laughs> uh, the Ideal Team Player by Pat Lincioni. And then The Power of Vulnerability by Dr. Brene Brown. Um, she is a freaking rock star. She's written a lot of good books. Um, that is not a business book per se, but there's definitely a lot of good stuff that could translate. It's more of an empathy kind of book. Uh, and then QBQ by John G. Miller. So those are some top ones. And I've got a, like 20 others that I could easily spout off, but those are some good ones to start you off. And then some of the ones in 2018 that I've been reading that have been pretty good. Um, Essentialism by Greg McEwen. I've actually read this several times before, um, but uh, I've reread it uh, in the last few weeks and it's just really solid. Uh, the Great Game of Business by Jack Stack. It's kind of interesting. He's, he's like a, you know, uh, basically like a metal worker, like a blue collar factory guy um, from uh, middle America who talks about uh, open book management, like opening up your financials and stuff like that. Very interesting, interesting read. 
Uh, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Pat Lencioni. I'm a Pat Lencioni fan. He's got a lot of good organizational health kind of related books. Uh, High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard. I'm actually reading that right now, um, and I find that to be pretty interesting. It's got some interesting take on some things. Uh, Traction by Gino Wickman. Traction uh, kind of lines up, very different vernacular, but has some similar concepts to Pat Lencioni stuff, um, but uh, very good kind of tactical, small business oriented stuff. And then Small Giants uh, by Bo Burlingham, another good one. So a uh, number of good books there uh, that uh, are really solid. Again, I've, I've read, I think I've read somewhere in the neighborhood of 130 different business and leadership books in the last five years maybe. Um, and these are some of my tops. So for what that's worth, you know, there's, I think I read somewhere there's 11,000 uh, business books written every year. So you got your picks. Uh, but anyway, these are some of the ones that I have enjoyed, purely just my own opinion, speculation based on my own background and all that kind of stuff. There's a zillion other good ones out there that you may find different, but I like these ones. All right, last question I have for this week is from Daniel DeBat on Twitter. Can you explain why you don't carry certain pen manufacturers? Are some companies very difficult to deal with or are they place too many constraints on the wholesaler? Uh, well, you just want me to like talk bad about these companies, don't you? Uh, no, uh, you know, it varies. There could be any number of reasons. Uh, there's so many different variables that go into um, a successful kind of wholesaler retailer relationship. And I'm purely on the retailing side. I don't sell wholesale to anyone else. Um, so I'm purely on the kind of retailing side. Um, so, uh, you know, many of our manufacturers are international, you know, because fountain pen culture is generally just greater and more established in, uh, you know, places like Japan, uh, China, India, many places in Europe. Uh, and um, so a lot of the manufacturers come from those places. Uh, and uh, here in the U.S., you know, we have to basically import. So we end up, you know, there's some, some companies we buy from direct, but a lot of them we go through distributors. So there's relationships there. Um, that can impact, um, you know, uh, the manufacturing, retailing kind of relationship. Um, so sometimes there could be language barriers. There could be kind of distribution barriers in terms of uh, currency conversion, political things like economic tariffs or, um, you know, just things like that coming from different countries, different taxes and customs fees and duties and all this kind of craziness. Uh, there could be some, you know, other things like, um, uh, I think I mentioned language barriers. Yeah, um, there could be, you know, just limited capacity. Like there's some brands that, you know, it's like five people and they're trying to sell globally and they're just, they can only produce so much. So they end up prioritizing certain things based on their own distribution strategy and goals and things like that. And uh, so it ends up being limited in some ways, you know. Um, you know, we end up dealing with that sometimes. Uh, being that, you know, other countries like, uh, you know, Pilot in Japan is a good example. So they have some products that come through Pilot USA into the U.S., but they have a lot of products that kind of get prioritized for the Japanese and Asian markets. Um, and part of that is just like they're at capacity in a lot of ways for a lot of products. So they don't bring certain things into the U.S. And it's like you can ask us to we're blue in the face, but they're just they're not going to do it because they don't have the capacity. Um, on the flip side of that, you can company like Noodler's, Nathan is at capacity for his ink, so he just doesn't ship as much internationally as the demand would um, would see uh, because of his limited capacity. So we end up being on that side of things sometimes. Um, could be a lack of a you know just desire to expand it based on their own things. Um, you know they might have some conditions about how they want to do distribution or marketing or whatever um, that that make it prohibitive. It could be the economics just don't work out. You know, there's certain brands that by the time they're able to distribute it, the shipping costs, the fees, the tariffs, all this other stuff, um, we would have to sell it at such a price where it just wouldn't be economical to do so. Um, so that could be a factor. There's just a lot of different things that could go on and kind of, it's amazing how many things have to kind of go right for it to, to actually make sense. Um, you know, there is uh, just a little bit, you know, especially, uh, um, so I made notes, I'm gonna stick to my notes. So online retailing specifically is tough for manufacturers, um, mainly because consistency is key more so than in like a brick and mortar scenario. Specifically, you think of a pen, um, you know, like a Peniter here, or even like, you know, this Homo sapiens, there's gonna be a lot of color variation and pattern variation, things like that. It's harder for us online to portray exactly what you're gonna get with a high variation product um, than you would in a brick and mortar store. If you're in a brick and mortar store and you saw this particular pen, you'd be like, I love 
how it's like 60% green and 30% black and 5 or 10% white. Somebody else might want something that's mostly white and not as much black and you know, all this kind of stuff. So um, in brick and mortar, if there's some variation, that's okay because you're seeing the actual thing that you're buying. Online, you're seeing a representation of what you're actually buying. So it gets difficult and manufacturers, some of them, you know, specifically if they come from cultures that are very brick and mortar centric and fountain pens, a lot of, there's still a lot of brick and mortar stores in Japan and parts of Europe. Uh, and online is not as big of a thing as it is say here in the US where there fricking are no brick and mortars, very few brick and mortar stores, not to discount brick and mortar stores at all, but just culturally, it's happening a lot. There's a lot of brick and mortar specialty stores, not just pens, but everywhere are kind of closing up. So uh, online is kind of the, the more practical way for most of America to do their pen shopping. And uh, that's just not something that all manufacturers understand and really have kind of grabbed hold of, um, especially if it's not in their native country uh, that way. So there's some of that going on. Uh, and there can be a little bit of a disconnect with new products that you see online and the availability of something globally. You know, the, as fast and as wonderful as social media communication can be, I can be here in my office in Virginia, I can shoot a video, have it uploaded in a couple of hours, and you are watching it in New Zealand or Finland or Africa. You know, it's like, it's amazing the distribution that can happen, but to actually ship physical products around the world like that, a little more complicated than that, um, especially to be able to provide it uh, from a manufacturing standpoint. It's like you can you can literally make a one-off of one pen, have it up on Instagram or have it on some social media channel. It kind of catches like wildfire. Everybody wants it and wants it to be available, but only one pen's ever been made. You know what I mean? So it's like it's kind of an interesting place right now with the speed of communication. Definitely is way faster than the speed of distribution. And that's something that globally is an issue with governments. It's an issue with, you know, uh, commercial kind of products in general. Um, so it's a really interesting thing. You see that, um, you know, and especially a passion driven community like fountain pens, people see something that's available. They want it a lot. It speaks to them. You know, it gets on fire in the community. Then the FOMO sets in the fear of missing out. And then everybody wants it that much more because it's hot, they can't have it, there's demand for it, but you can't find it anywhere. So it just gets to be this really interesting place. You know, There's some brands that just don't have the capacity for us, um, or they might have a business strategy around selling direct. Um, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. That's just the way that they need to do it based on their own business goals or desires. And that's just kind of um, you know where we end up sometimes. Specifically, I think of brands like Conid, love Conid. I've shot emails back and forth with them. They're just a small manufacturer and they don't have the ability to distribute globally. So, um, you know, I'm trying to maintain relations if they ever get to that point. They may, may not, they may not, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's something that I would totally carry it if I could. They don't have capacity for it. You know, Franklin Kristoff is another good one. We get asked about Franklin Kristoff a lot. They got a great reputation, you know, more power to them. They distribute, you know, direct and um, don't don't sell uh, their product line. Um, they've done like some collaborations and stuff uh, and maybe some exclusives kind of with some other individual retailers. Maybe that would be a possibility for us in the future, but not their like regular offering. Um, you know, Canalea pens, we ask about them a lot. Um, Ackerman Inc. You know, there's all different kinds of kind of smaller um, manufacturers or, or, you know, distributors that have these products um, that we get asked about because, you know, it's, it seems natural. Uh, and we'll usually try and track down and, and cultivate those relationships. But ultimately, if it gets down to they don't have supply or they can't provide us with things, then there's only so much that we can do, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there's others that, uh, you know, maybe have their own desires, like they want a brick and mortar presence. You know, Mont Blanc is that way. Um, you know, I've had, you know, direct communication with them over a number of years. And basically they want to have brick and mortar led retailers. And um, without a presence of brick and mortar, there is no conversation to be had. And they've made that clear. They weren't, you know, uh, rude about it, but they basically just said, look, and you know, if you want to set up a brick and mortar presence, by all means, let's go nuts. But they didn't quite word it like that. But they said, yeah, we can do that. But um, without a brick and mortar presence, you know, we're just not going to do it. And I was like, you know, a little saddened by that. And I was like, well, I completely respect that that's the way you want to do business. Equally, this is the way I'm going to do business. We're online only and we're going to stay that way for the time being. So uh, until one of us wants to change our minds, 
um, you know, we'll just stay in contact and then, uh, you know, we'll stay amicable and I'll still speak highly of your brand, but it's just not going to be a thing. Um, same thing with Hipponoto. We reached out to them, you know, they do the thick Tomoe River uh, notebooks. Um, it was the same kind of thing. They gave us back the, you know, we want brick and mortar uh, stores. And we were like, okay, if you change your mind, let us know. We're, we're here for you. But, um, you know, that's their desire. So, you know, there could be all these explanations like that. <clears throat> There's others that are small and don't have the capacity to produce what we need. I mentioned a couple already. Um, basically, all of the like small independent pen manufacturers, you know, Herbert Pens, you know, Chet Herbert lives like 15 minutes from our office. I've like had lunch with him a couple times, and you know, he's got like we'd go to the pen club uh, together and stuff like. There's like a Richmond pen club that's kind of starting up, and um, actually, the first meeting is tonight. Uh, Wednesday tonight, uh, anybody who's in the Richmond, Virginia area, there's a local, pen well, it'll have already happened by the time this video publishes, so womp womp. Uh, but anyway, maybe you can catch the next one. Um, I'm actually missing it tonight because our church is putting on a, this choir song fest thing and Rachel and I are singing at it and it just conflicted. But anyway, um, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, Chet Herbert's a good example. He just doesn't have capacity to provide us with anything. <clears throat> nice guy, would love to do something with him, but it's going to be a while before he ramps up. Um, and Edison Pens is an example. Um, Edison was that way for a long time. Got to the point where they caught up and expanded and all that kind of stuff, so we started the collaboration. They have, you know, a few different retailers now. They're still really pretty niche, and, you know, it's like our seasonal premiere. I think this last one lasted us, like, a week or a few days, and then it was, like, gone. And they're just, they're getting new machinery. They're ramping up. But, you know, we're limited by their capacity, you know, more power to them. Like they, it's hard, like manufacturing is hard, especially ramping up and distributing globally. It's really tough. So I have a lot of respect for anybody that can do that, but that just ends up being a constraint for us. Um, so maintaining good event relations and working out smooth logistics behind the scenes is a surprisingly huge part of what we do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a big part of providing a stable and steady supply of products that you would expect to see from a retailer like us. Um, and we spend more time than you would think doing that. Um, and uh, the better we do it and the more time we spend on it, the less you think about it or feel it, uh, frankly. It's kind of like redoing our website um, that we launched this week. It's like the fact that it was relatively seamless um, as actually speaks to just how much work we put in ahead of time to make it uh, relatively smooth. So the um, thing I want to leave off with this question is I super appreciate being asked about brands like this and my team, you know, we actually communicate a lot about what brands you all are talking about and asking us about because we're at the point now where um, we've got a proven track record of speaking with you as the community using our vendor relations to source out products or, or acquire things and then serve them back out to you. That's how we started, excuse me, nine years ago, um, was speaking with grassroots with the community, sourcing out things you wanted, making it available, and then providing reviews and education around those products. Um, it's a really solid, anybody out there, you know, looking to hone their, their retailing game, not pens, hopefully, because, you know, we're trying to work in that space, but, um, you know, more power to you if you want to do that. But um, really in any retailing environment, if you talk with an engaged community, you source out good products that they want, build good vendor relations, educate well and provide good service, you can't really go wrong. You know, it kind of seems common sense. It's not complicated, it's just hard. Um, so anyway, we love to continue to hear about that. So keep on asking us about all these brands, even if the answer is, you know, we've tried and, and they're not ready to expand right now. Hey, at least then you know, and we, we keep it on our radar, um, keeps us fresh for you. But we always appreciate that kind of like grassroots communication. All right, that's it for this week. <clears throat> Good old 12 question Q&A, got them all in here. So um, my question of the week for you this week is what is the next pen brand you would want us to start carrying? I'm just gonna go for a big old ask. Let us know what you wanna see that we don't already have. I would love to know what that is and then we can work at it. Uh, and then my writing prompt for this week this is the third writing prompt that I've done. Uh, hopefully that you know, some of you are finding value in these. It's a yet to be proven uh, ongoing thing here in Q&A, but uh, still I'm gonna give you a little little bit of a writing prompt if, in case it inspires you to actually use your pens this week. Um, but I want you to write about the nicest thing that anyone has ever done for you. So give you some good positive vibes. Maybe it'll inspire you to write to that person, but that's not necessarily the, the exercise here. I just want you to think about, recall, and then write out maybe how you felt, what happened uh, for the nicest thing that anyone's ever done for you. That's it for this week. I hope you get a chance to cruise around on the new GoulayPens.com. Give us your feedback. 
as nicely as possible if you can. We've been working hard at it and my dear wife is uh, quite tired, but uh, still very glad to see things are going pretty smooth. Uh, and uh, we will uh, see you later. Thanks so much for watching and right on. Thank you.